a great pleasure to have our very own Larry Frolov talk to us about joint evolution of a scalar electric point charges and their fields in one space dimension. Go on, Larry. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's really great to be here. I feel like I'm surrounded by friends and family that I've been working with for so long. Um, so it's, it's great to have you all here. Um, sorry for the mouthful of the title, but yeah, today we're gonna to be talking about joint evolution problems and specifically we'll be talking about scalar electric point charges in one space dimension. So in particular, I'll start by talking about, uh, oh, and also uh, I'm presenting this, this research, but it was based on work that I did with my advisor Shadi and uh, mostly partly with, with Samuel Lee. Um, so first I'll give a general layout for the talk. Um, the overall goal is to study the physical system composed of a scalar potential. And later we're also going to introduce a vector potential coupled to point particles in one space dimension. Um, using just the assumption of local conservation of energy, we're going to rigorously derive the force law that acts on our relativistic particle. Um, and then we're going to prove the well-posedness of this force law by showing the existence of a unique uh, joint evolution for our field particle system. Uh, lastly, we're also gonna discuss the behavior of the self-force, what it's actually doing to our system, um, and yeah, so in particular, we're going to show that the self-force is going to be inversely proportional to the velocity itself. Namely, we're going to show that the self-force is, in fact, restoring. Um, so I want to start uh, by uh, talking about why we care about joint evolution problems, uh, because typically when physicists study uh, the dynamics of particles and fields, they do so by treating the dynamics of the particles and fields independently of each other. Uh, so namely, if you're given a field, then you solve for the trajectories of the particles via a force law, or alternatively, if you're given a charged trajectory, then you can solve for the electromagnetic or whatever field uh, that is sourced uh, by the current, right? This is typically what we do in undergraduate, graduate courses, so on and so forth. Um, but there is a fundamental problem in treating these two objects as being independent of each other, which is that the dynamics that comes from doing this cannot conserve the total energy of the system. Uh, so to like illustrate this point, you know, I have a neat little uh, animation for you all. Here we see uh, a, let me zoom in a bit. Uh, so if we zoom in a bit, we have a particle that is initially stationary. And then we see that once it starts moving due to some external radiation, um, the field that it's sourcing also begins to move, right? The motion of the particle itself generates motion in the field that it's sourcing. And you can kind of see on this like outer crust of the uh, wave, right? The, the, the uh, wave that's propagating outwards, this has some energy. Uh, namely, the field that the particle is sourcing gets some increase in the field's kinetic energy. If you treat the dynamics of the particles as like being independent from the dynamics of the field, um, then you kind of ask yourself, okay, well, where is this energy coming from? I have external radiation that's acting on the particle, and all of a sudden the field that the particle is sourcing has this increase in kinetic energy, but where is this energy coming from? Uh, and the answer is it's coming from nowhere. So if we want to really be able to study uh, this rigorously and be able to uh, have the energy of our system be conserved, we need to have both the field and the particle evolving at the same time. So we need to have a joint evolution problem. Uh, this, so let's, let's move on. So that's the motivation for why we care about joint evolution of particles in their fields. Um, but we also have a problem when we try to study the joint evolution of particles in their fields, uh, namely for physical systems such as the, uh, such as in the case of the Maxwell-Lorentz regime for electromagnetism. Namely, the Maxwell-Lorentz regime for electromagnetism very famously does not give rise to a well-posed joint evolution uh, for point charges. Right? And this can be very easily seen in the form of our Lorentz force. 
we say that if you have point charges, uh, the force acting on it is given by Q times E plus V cross B, where E and B are the electromagnetic fields. But if you're also allowing the charges to source the part, uh, a part of the electromagnetic field, then the electric field, electromagnetic field is not defined at the location of the charge, right? If you consider a stationary charge, which has a singularity blow up like one over R squared, uh, then you find that the electromagnetic field is not defined at the location of the charge. And so this force is simply undefined. Uh, and so it's it's been studied extensively and it's been shown that this does not give rise to well closed joint evolution problems because this force, this Lorentz force is simply uh, ill-posed. So we are motivated to kind of propose a new force law based on the principle of energy conservation, right? At the very start, I talked about how the reason why we care about joint evolution problems is because uh, we know that uh, treating the uh, particles and fields as independently from each other does not conserve total energy. So let's see if there exists a new force law solely based on the principle of energy conservation. And in fact, there is. Uh, Kiesling proposed this new force law. Uh, and then there was uh, a pretty, a uh, pretty wide success in applying this force law to prove the well-posedness of the joint evolution problem uh, of point charges in the BLTP regimen of electromagnetism. Let me interrupt you, uh, Larry. Huh? So it's not the principle of energy conservation. It's momentum conservation, okay? Yeah. That's yeah, important. sorry. Energy, yes, it, it's it's momentum. When I think of, of energy, I think of the... Uh, stress energy tensor, but that should really be the uh, stress energy momentum tensor. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you very much. That That's absolutely true. Um, yeah. So so this was, we were able to, to they, they were able to show the well posedness of the joint evolution problem for point charges in the BLTP regimen. Um, but the dynamics in that system were, were quite complex. It, it's, it's, you know, uh, sometimes difficult to, to understand. And so the kind of goal that I want to uh, do today is I'd like to study uh, scalar particles in only one plus one dimensions. Uh, and with the idea being that the dynamics in one plus one dimensions will be a lot simpler to understand. Uh, it'll be a toy model for us to better understand the self force that charged particles exert on themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's see if that yeah. is in fact Good. One more interruption. Also, the, the point on Huang et al. Uh, uh, Wu and uh, his collaborators, they considered the scattering problem of a single charge uh, with a fixed uh, scattering potential, right? And uh, they proved uh, global well-posedness the, for the joint evolution in that scattering problem. No? So the well-posedness of the joint evolution as an initial value problem locally, that was proved by Charlie and myself. Yeah, yeah, that that's absolutely true. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for for. Uh, also, Larry, say what BLTP is. Right. BLTE is Bopplan Thomas Podolsky regimen of electrodynamics. This is a higher order uh, modification of Maxwell's equations. Uh, the higher order uh, takes some of the singular. It, it smooths out some of the singularities which exist in Maxwell Lorentz and and makes the dynamics. Uh, it makes it more complicated, but it also makes it uh, more regular. And it gives us the regularity that we need in order to, to discuss uh, principle of energy conservation. Okay, so now that, so now let's, let's, move, let's move to talking about scalar particles in one plus one dimensions. Um, and in particular, some, some people may not have any intuitions about scalar particles at all. Uh, so I'd like to spend a second talking about that. Um, the study of scalar particles can be motivated by its connection to Yukawa's work on the strong force. Uh, in particular, if you consider the potential for a stationary scalar particle, uh, this is given by equation one. We have negative Laplacian plus alpha squared u is equal to a delta of x. I'm considering a stationary particle at x equals zero. So we see that there is a, uh, a, a point singularity in the second derivatives of the scalar field u alpha squared alpha here is the mass of the scalar field. And if you consider this potential, then in n equals three dimensions, right? So in three space dimensions, this potential gives rise to something that you'll, you know, many of you have seen 
are familiar with the Yukawa potential, right? This is a potential that's similar to the Coulomb potential, but it has a much shorter range, right? And that's because there's also this exponential decay that's like e to the minus alpha r. Uh, so in particular, in the n equals one case, right, where in one space dimension, we also have this exponential decay in the case that alpha is greater than zero. But in the case that alpha is just equal to zero, the potential does not decay. Uh, in fact, it, it, it increases like absolute value of x. Uh, and this is the uh, case that we're going to be studying today. Uh, we're going to be studying the n equals one and the alpha equals one. Again, with the goal of just studying the simplest dynamical cases. Uh, and in the future, we're going to return back to the alpha greater than zero case. Uh, but that's that's outside the scope of, of this talk. Um, so on let's let's set up our, our our joint evolution. Let's set up the constituents of our of our space time. So we're working on a relativistic flat space time. This is with a metric whose signature is one negative one. And we have an action. And this action is an action functional of the scalar field U and also of the uh, trajectories of the particles, which I label Z. Uh, so in particular, the Lagrangian density associated with this action is just the standard Lagrangian density associated to a massless scalar field. Uh, and also we have the uh, Lagrangian density of the particles. And this seems like a lot. Uh, so in particular, the mi, the ai, and the zi, these are the bare mass, charge, and space-time positions of the i particle. Uh, notice that we also have this delta squared term here. And this delta squared represents the one plus one dimensional delta function. So this is the, uh, the, the space-time delta function. Uh, theta here is an arbitrary parameterization of the world line of the particles. Uh, and you'll notice that this Lagrangian density, right, since it has an integral of some terms multiplied by a delta squared, um, one of these deltas, specifically the, the delta x zero term, this gets integrated out. And so this Lagrangian density is singular along the, uh, is singular in, in, in space along the world lines of the particles. It's because we're still left with this, uh, delta of x1 minus zi terms. Uh, let's see. Yes, I think that's all I want to say about the setup. So now that we have an action, we can take variations of our action, right? We want to find the critical points. And we are given the following equations of motion for our system. We have the, uh, we find that the scalar field uh, has sources in its second derivative. The D'Alembertian of U has uh, the endpoint particles acting as sources in the D'Alembertian of U, in particular with charge AI. And also we have, if we take variations with respect to the trajectories with respect to Z, then we obtain our force law. And notice that in this force law, we have that the force is proportional to uh, the charges multiplied by the first derivatives of a potential. So this is kind of similar to the force law given by uh, the Lorentz force, uh, except it's a little bit different in a, in a few ways. Uh, in particular, this thing that we call P here, this is not in fact just given by the MI multiplied by the four velocity. Uh, this is a little bit more complex than that. It's given by mi minus the charge multiplied by the scalar potential evaluated at the location of the charge. And in fact, this is telling us there's, there's something a bit deeper going on here. Um, we call this p, by the way, the dynamical momentum of the I particle. Something deep that's going on here is that the mass of scalar particles is not just given by this mi, but the observed mass of the particle, i.e. we call this the dynamical mass, is actually something that changes in time. There is a field contribution uh, to the mass of scalar particles. And this is something that's been well known for a while that uh, the masses of scalar particles are not constant. And in fact, fields, the scalar field does contribute some portion of the observable mass. 
So in general, what you should kind of think of is this, uh, I introduced this M star I as the uh, bare mass minus uh, the charge multiplied by the scalar field evaluated at the location of the particle, uh, you should think of this as the true observed mass. And so in that case, the dynamical momentum is just the mass multiplied by the four velocity, which is what we normally expect. And then we do get something that's similar to the Lorentz force. Still different in a, in a few ways, but uh, yeah. So, so I have a question for number um for your for for equation seven. Mm -hmm. So I mean it looks like you have pi. Oh no, sorry, never mind. Uh, pi new. Okay, no, never mind, never mind. I have my question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry if I'm throwing indices all over the place without. Uh, no, no, no. It's my bad. So okay, so we have um we have this force law, and I'd like to talk about. I, I mentioned that it's similar to the Lorentz force, but this really isn't electromagnetism. And I'd like to mention a few key differences. Namely, the first one is that the force law implies that for scalar charges, uh, we have that like charges attract uh, while opposites repel. And this is completely different than in electromagnetism, right? In electromagnetism, uh, opposite charges attract while like charges repel. Um, but once again, if you just kind of remember that the uh, originally, we connected uh, the scalar potential to the Yukawa potential and nuclear forces, strong forces. Um, it kind of makes sense that this should be the case, because in the case of uh, the strong nuclear force, rather, I should really say just the nuclear force, not the strong force. In the case of the nuclear force, um, it is a purely attractive force. And so it makes sense that we should take all of our charges to be of like signs because the uh, the interactions that scalar potential should give rise to between particles should be purely attractive. You could so also the fact think that of gravity, Larry, right? Hmm? You could also think of gravity. It's also attractive, right? Yes, I think I'm. I'm. I'm very. Um, I. I I'm very hesitant to draw any connection with scalar potentials and gravity um, right. because I think with gravity, you'll end up with nonlinear equations as opposed to what we're working with, right? All of the equations that we're working with are linear. Well, it's a one Newtonian, Newtonian gravity. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I, 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 I just when we're thinking about what kind of physical phenomenon we want to be associating with scalar potentials, right? With the vector potentials, we associate those to electromagnetism. With scalar potentials, I think we want to associate them to nuclear forces. Um, is I don't. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. But yeah. So the. Uh, we're going to be taking all of our charges to be of like signs. And uh, this actually clears up another potential conceptual issue, uh, namely, which is that, right, in this slide, we define the dynamical mass to be given by this uh, bare mass minus the charge multiplied by the field evaluated at CI. But one potential issue that we could have run into is what happens if this term is negative? Right, what happens if somehow the mi star becomes zero? Then um, actually our dynamical, our, our equations would, would break down. You could uh, potentially conceive of like, as, um, as this changes, perhaps the dynamical mass of your particle goes to zero. And so your force has some sort of blow up. Um, one might run into, what one might be afraid of this sort of thing happening. But interestingly enough, uh, by, by taking this condition that all of our charges be of like sign, we have that the interactions uh, between all of our particles uh, give rise to field contributions that are strictly positive when it comes to the mass. So this negative AIU is going to be strictly greater than zero. So at no point should we find that the dynamical masses of our particles are ever zero. In fact, the contributions of the interactions between the particles to the mass 
is going to cause the mass to always increase. It'll never decrease. Uh, so long as you take the bare mass of your particles to be positive. In the negative bare mass case, uh, that's also outside the, the scope of this, of this talk. So that's all I want to say about um, the introducing scalar particles. I'm at 221. Okay. So moving on to part two, uh, we're going to talk about deriving the force law. And you might be thinking to yourself, I thought we already have a force law. We have a force law that's given by the or the, the, uh, the principle of least action. Uh, but recall that also from the principle of least action, uh, U satisfies that the second derivatives of U are proportional to this integral of delta squared, and this is proportional to uh, delta of x1 minus zi1. In other words, each charge is acting as a singularity in the second derivatives of the scalar potential. So written here, right? Uh, d squared u is singular along each particle's world line. And so this automatically implies that the first derivatives of the potential are undefined, is undefined at each particle's location. And this spells disaster for the force law, because the force law only makes sense if we are able to evaluate the first derivatives of the potential at the location of the charge. Right, and this isn't this is not an issue in the case that you aren't dealing with joint evolution problems. If you're dealing with those, uh, what physicists typically deal with, where you're given a field and you try and find the force that acts on the particle, then that's not an issue because you can just make sure that the field that you're given uh, does have a first derivative, which is defined at the particle's location. But in the case that we're really seriously considering joint evolution problems. Uh, this is simply undefined. And in fact, this force law cannot give rise to a well-posed uh, joint evolution. So another way of saying this is that there are no joint evolutions where the action is minimized because equation eight and equation nine cannot be satisfied at the same time. So we're at a loss, right? We have this issue that's similarly similar to the case of Maxwell's equations, right? Maxwell electromagnetism, our force law is simply opposed. But recall at the very start, right, we motivated the study of joint evolution problems in the first place by discussing back reaction and the idea that we want our, uh, ener our, our energy momentum of our system to be conserved, right? We want these to, to be conserved. So we might ask ourselves, is there any force law which conserves our system's total stress energy momentum? You'll notice I'm saying energy momentum and not just energy. So once again, sorry about only having the, the energy here. It should say energy momentum. Um, so energy conservation of energy momentum is expressed typically by setting um, the stress energy tensor of the whole system to satisfy the divergence uh, to be equal to zero. Sorry, the divergence of the stress energy tensor d mu t mu nu equal to zero. And there's uh, n plus one many parts of our stress energy tensor. Each particle has its own uh, contribution to the stress to the total stress energy of the system. And also we have the stress energy tensor of the field, the, the scalar field, which I represent as T mu nu s. So I'll write down what the stress energy tensors are. We have that the stress energy tensor of the i particle is given by the dynamical mass of the i particle multiplied by uh, this integral, u i mu, u i nu, delta squared, uh, where we're integrating over the world line of our particle. Once again, notice that it's an integral of a delta squared, which means that one of these deltas gets integrated out. And really what we have is a stress energy tensor that is singular precisely along the world line of the i particle. And then uh, secondly, we have the stress energy tensor of the scalar field. And this is just the standard stress energy tensor of a massless scalar field. So we ask ourselves, is there a force law which conserves uh, our system's energy where our system is composed of, of these terms? And in fact, there is. And this leads us to our first theorem, which is, if you suppose that T mu nu s satisfies a certain integrability assumption, 
then assuming conservation of energy in the weak sense that the integral of the divergence is equal to zero uh, for all omega, all space-time regions, then this returns a unique force law, namely uh, the uh, force is given by this right-hand side of equation 14 over here. So, and this force law holds for all time until two particles world lines cross. In the case that two particles world lines cross, then we do have an issue with specifying what the force law is. But for all time until that happens, uh, this force law is unique and it must hold. Uh, in particular, let me explain kind of what this right-hand side is. Uh, this n mu is the normalized four acceleration. Uh, this is, um, this is the, the covector that's normal to the uh, four velocity of the particle. And this, uh, this bracket notation, this denotes the jump in X1 at the location of the particle. So it's the jump in space at the location of the particle. And the way to think about this force law is essentially that the force that's acting on the particle is negative the local flux of the stress energy momentum around the particle's location. So that's, I'm not going to go too in depth into the details of how we derive this force law because I don't wanna to get too technical with it, but there was a previous talk that I gave um, a few weeks ago or perhaps a few months ago now um, where I do go more into depth on uh, how to derive this force law. But I think enough people have gone over it that this is okay to just write this. Uh, in particular, I wanna note that it only makes sense to assume conservation of energy in the weak sense, strictly because the stress energy tensor, as I mentioned before, the total stress energy tensor, uh, this is a singular quantity. It's singular along the world lines of the part. So it doesn't make sense to set d mu t mu nu to be equal to zero when um, it's, this is a distribution. This is uh, conservation of energy only makes sense in a distributional sense. Uh, but we still find that assuming conservation of energy uh, in the weak distributional sense, this does in fact return a unique force law. And in fact, we can explicitly compute what this force is. Uh, and so in fact, using the general solution for you, um, it's a tedious calculation, but you can do it. I did it for you. Um, so I, I hope this is appreciated. Um, you can explicitly calculate the force and in fact, you find that the right-hand side of the force law is given by the standard external forces, right? These are the standard forces that are associated with the external radiation. Uh, they match up with the same predictions if you had just taken the principle of least action. But um, the contribution of the particle's own field to the, uh, to the force law has now been replaced with something that is in fact well-defined. It's replaced with this term over here. This term, which is proportional to the negative velocity of the i part. Uh, and that's quite important. And I'll talk about that in a bit, why this is important. Um, so this is the force law, but we do still have an issue, which is ultimately our goal is to understand how do self forces affect the motion of particles. And in order to do that, uh, what we really need to do is um, talk about not dp1 over d tau. What we're really interested in is du1 over, right? We're interested in the derivative of the four velocity, of the, the mm -hmm. velocity. Uh, but since the dynamical momentum also has this m star term, this dynamical mass that's changing in time, uh, that's not, this, this equation is not necessarily going to really tell us what our particle is doing. So instead, let's use the chain rule very quickly and let's just calculate what this is equal to. You use the chain rule, you use the product rule, so on and so forth. And in fact, you find that the uh, equations of motion for your particle is given by the dynamical mass multiplied by the derivative of the velocity is equal to negative the charge squared over two times the velocity plus 
the standard external terms that you would receive from the um, from the principle of least action. So this is really telling us something fundamental about um, this is really telling us something fundamental about conservation of energy, namely uh, before right when we were considering the dynamics of our particles and our fields as separately from each other, then the only thing that we were really considering were the external force terms. But we had this issue that I talked about at the beginning, that the total stress energy of the system wasn't being conserved because the uh, motion of the particle was generating motion in the field that it's sourcing. So sorry, I kind of skipped to the next slide because I realized that I was saying words on the next slide in my rant. Um, so if we just consider like, let's say a stationary, single stationary particle perturbed by some radiation, then the motion of this particle is going to generate motion in the field that it's sourcing. Um, and what's happening is that there is an increase in the field's kinetic energy. So in order for this to happen, and in order for the total energy of our system to be conserved, sorry, energy momentum, there needs to be a decrease in the particle's kinetic energy. And in fact, that is precisely what our force is doing. That's precisely what our force law is telling us. This is taking the form of a restoring self-force. So if you look over here, back in equation 16, uh, as the particle gets perturbed from rest and it starts moving, there is this new additional force term that's introduced in order to offset the energy that's generated by the motion of the particle in the field. So it's an unexpected result, but at the same time, it is very expected. It's expected that the particles kinetic energy should, de should decrease from the process of back reaction. And that's exactly what we've shown here. So, sorry, I know I'm moving quite fast. I'm not really stopping for questions as much as I should. Um, does anyone have any questions about uh, the self force and like kind of what we're what we're doing here and where this is coming about? Yeah, I have. Uh, why do you call that the field's kinetic energy? Why not just the field's energy? Um, so I think I'm. It, it, it is the field's total kinetic energy, but in the kind of animation that I showed earlier, it it, it seems. It definitely seems much more explicit that the field's kinetic energy is increasing. But you're absolutely right that also the field's potential energy is increasing. Yeah, it's just uh, difficult to uh, uh, make a sharp definition of what one means by the kinetic energy uh, of a field. No? So it's uh, better to just speak of field energy changes, and it has to be at the expense of the particle kinetic energy, and same for momentum, of course. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so definitely the thing that's that's happening here is that the motion of the charge is increasing the field's energy um, because the particle is sourcing a part of the field. Um, and so this has to be at the expense, as you say, of the particles, um, of the particle's kinetic energy. And similarly, also the uh, particle is, is increased, the motion of the particle is generating field momentum. And this has to be at the expense of the particles uh, momentum. Yeah. So let's return back to the presentation. Okay. So if there is no more questions on this topic, then let's talk about, um, now that we have a force law uh, for scalar particles, which now really takes into account the, the process of back reaction. Uh, first, let's prove the well-posedness. Let's, let's show that this does in fact give rise to a unique global in time solution. Um, and also the, uh, let's, let's talk about the asymptotics of this evolution. So for a single scalar charge perturbed by some incoming radiation, the evolution equations are given by the following. We have the same PD as earlier, right? The del inversion of U is equal to uh, the right-hand side. Here we only have one uh, scalar particle acting as a singularity in the second derivatives of the scalar potential. 
And then we also have the initial data. And the initial data can really be split up into two pieces. There is the stationary, there is the uh, part of the potential that is generated by the stationary particle for all time uh, t less than zero. And then we also have these v0 and v1 terms, which are quite arbitrary here. Uh, they're really introduced to introduce some sort of external radiation, which is going to come and then hit the particle. It's going to propagate and then hit the particle and then eventually leave. So uh, this, you know, by linearity, we can introduce this capital V um, that satisfies the uh, free uh, wave equation. And it has these initial data, uh, V0 and V1. And so we find that this is the external radiation that is acting on the scalar particle. Uh, yes. So lastly, we have the, um, the evolution equations for the particle itself, right? First, we just have um, dz1 over d tau is uh, the dynamical momentum divided by the dynamic mass. This is just by definition. And then we also have the force law. And I said earlier that it's given by negative a squared over two uh, times the four velocity plus the external first force terms. I didn't specify what those are. Here is it in all its glory. It's just the charge multiplied by d1 of v. So uh, we want to prove that this uh, joint evolution problem is in fact well posed, namely that uh, for specified initial uh, data for our uh, particle's initial position and its initial momentum, and also if you specify what the radiation terms which are going to come and hit the particle are, then uh, we want to show that there is a unique global in time solution uh, to, this, um, to this set of differential equations. And in fact, that is what we prove. We have that for the following theorem. For any set of particle parameters, um, and for any set of functions v0, v1, such that a v is less than zero everywhere, and such that partial one v satisfies some regularity conditions. In particular, I'm going to ask that it be bounded and Lipschitz for all time. Then the joint initial value problem admits a unique global in time solution. Uh, the fact that we take partial one v to be bounded and Lipschitz for all time is a very standard. Um, this is this is a, a very standard um, regularity assumption that we take on our external radiation. Uh, Lipschitz and bounded is something that's it comes up quite frequently in proving well posedness of solutions for differential equations. I do want to note that this AV less than zero everywhere, right? This is kind of supposed to be synonymous with that charge condition that I mentioned at the very start. Uh, this AV less than zero is very important because the external radiation is also going to have a contribution to the mass of our scalar particle. And if we don't have AV less than zero, then you might run into that issue that um, the mass of the scalar particle might become uh, might become zero. So in order to ensure that um, our scalar particle doesn't suddenly become massless at any point in time, uh, we want to uh, take this sign condition on, uh, on V0 and V1 such that V uh, satisfies AV is less than zero. Uh, so Again, I'm not going to get too technical with the proof of this because I've gotten technical with the proof of this before in, in our last talk. Um, but I do want to go over the intuition of the proof. Um, namely, I want to go over the physicist's intuition of the proof. So at the very start, I was talking about how typically when physicists study uh, particle field evolution problems, right? They do so in the following way. They they you know, given a field, you can solve for the trajectory of your particle via a force law, or alternatively, given um, your trajectory, you can solve for the field that it's sourcing via just the, the, the field equation that we had earlier. So one might kind of ask themselves, um, or rather, I think I did uh, when I was an undergrad, I asked myself, what happens if we create a sequence of particle trajectories and fields recursively, right? So namely, 
um, you plug in the field to just, you, you start with a field and you plug it in to solve for a trajectory. And then you use this trajectory to solve for the next field and then so on and so forth, right? So will this thing uh, converge? And the answer in our specific case, in the joint initial value problem that we uh, set forth using this uh, force law derived from energy conservation, the answer is yes. And in fact, by proving the convergence of this sequence, that is how you get the unique trajectory uh, field solution um, to the joint initial value problem. Because whatever this sequence of particle tra trajectories and fields converges to, it'll converge to something such that when you take the field U and you plug it into the force law, the trajectory that you get out of it is precisely the original field that was sourced by the particle. So the, um, the, the thing that the sequence converges to is precisely the solution to our joint initial value problem. And I think that, you know, without a doubt, that's, in my opinion, the most beautiful thing about this, this project. I, I really do quite enjoy visualizing that. Um, so I won't go over the proof of the convergence of the sequence, um, because once again, I, I went over it in a, in a past talk. Uh, it does in fact use contraction mapping principle, right? We, we show that this, um, we show that there, there is a, a this, this constructing this sequence can be thought of as uh, a mapping where you, you uh, th this, this maps trajectories to other trajectories and fields to other fields. And in fact, under some norm, this um, is a contraction mapping. And so therefore the sequence of these has to uh, converge to, to something. So yes, I, I, won't, I won't go into the details. Um, all right, so moving on, uh, we do have well posedness, um, but what exactly is our self force doing? What is it accomplishing? What are the effects? So uh, we write earlier, I wrote down that we have um, that M star du1 over dx0 was given by this self force term plus the external force terms where the self-force term is given by negative a squared over two times the uh, first component of the four velocity. Uh, and then the external first force terms were external force terms. So asymptotically, what is our self-force accomplishing? Well, the, in order to talk about what our self-forces are doing, I would rather first talk about something else, which is that, um, in fact, after some finite amount of time, the external force vanishes um, in the case of a particle that's perturbed by some compactly supported radiation. So over here at the very start, right, I specified this V0 and this V1. And in the case that the radiation was initially compactly supported, then what you'll have is that the radiation will propagate, it will hit the particle, and then eventually it will pass through the particle and disappear. The radiation is propagating at the speed of light. And since the particle is not really able to keep up with the speed of light, you'll find that the radiation will propagate, it'll hit the particle, it'll pass, and it'll, it'll go away. So the, uh, before talking about what our self forces are doing, first I'd like to mention that there is a theorem that um, I proved once again, I go over the details in the last talk, which is that after some finite time, the external forces from the compactly supported radiation, this vanishes. And so after some point in time, our particle becomes free, but even though it's free, there are still forces acting on the particle. There's still a self force. And amazingly enough, what this self force is doing, you know, once you have this F external gone, the only thing that you're left with is uh, the dynamical mass times the rate of change of the velocity is proportional to negative the velocity itself, it's not too surprising that it's going to cause the velocity to decay. We have that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a T sub epsilon such that for all time after that T sub epsilon, the um, velocity is less than epsilon in magnitude. 
In other words, if you take some uh, initially stationary particle and then you perturb it with some radiation, then what's going to happen is the radiation is going to start to move and then the um, it's going to, eventually the external force terms are gonna go away, the radiation will pass through. And when left to its own devices, it will asymptotically return back towards rest. I also really want to note that all of these calculations are done in the rest frame of the particle. Initially, our particle was at rest, right? So in the frame where the particle was initially at rest. If we were working, yeah, if we were working in the frame that our particle was initially moving at some other velocity, then in that case, you would find that the uh, particle would asymptotically return to the velocity it started out at. So this is still, all of the, all the dynamics that are happening here are still Lorentz covariants. Um, all of our equations, the force law, all of it was all Lorentz covariants. Um, so I just want to, you know, not to, to generate confusion and say that like all particles must return to rest eventually in any frame. Um, so yeah, we, this is the, this is literally what our self force is, is, is in fact doing. Uh, and in fact, I have plotted some trajectories. I, I think I showed these also in my, my last talk. Um, so you'll see here that the particle is initially um, perturbed by, it's initially stationary, it gets hit with some radiation. Uh, you can see that um, the radiation I'm hitting it with in the simulation is incredibly strong. This thing is moving at like some non-trivial percentage of the speed of light, um, just to show you that like the effects of the self, because this is the regime in which the effects of the self force would be large. Uh, and then we see here that eventually the particle starts to slow down because the radiation has passed. Um, and this is only from time t equals zero to 15. If we extend it further, then you can very clearly see that the particle is returning towards, towards rest, right? It's becoming a horizontal line. Notice my time axis is my y axis, my space axis is my, my x axis. Um, alternatively, I have an animation, which is neat. So here we have the particle initially starts out at rest, and then it starts getting perturbed by some radiation. And you can see that the uh, field it's generating, which I've plotted here, it has this, um, right, it starts wiggling, right? In other words, the particle's motion is generating, it's causing these waves to, to propagate outwards. Um, but in order for the total energy of the system to be conserved, uh, eventually we find that the particle's kinetic energy has to get sapped, it has to decrease, uh, and it eventually asymptotically returns back towards rest. Uh, yes, so are there any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I was muted, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when you start that simulation, so the blue lines are perfectly straight, and then they get wiggly on a small scale, see? And yeah. then the large scale wiggles happen. So the, is this an artifact, these very small scale wiggles, or what is that, from the plotting program? Uh, the, the, the wiggles? Yeah, the oh, very oh. small wiggles. Right, yes. So that, that's an artifact of the, ah. the, the program. Yeah, yeah but my... it's funny because they are, when you start that simulation, they, they are really straight. There are no little wiggles, no? And then they build up, and then it starts with this large-scale wiggle. So it's a little uh, perplexing. So, But okay, if that's an artifact, then it's just like to ignore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say you should really imagine these as just straight lines. They are, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that's just an artifact of my, my computing of the field. Was not was not perfect because I'm I'm using an approximation uh, schematic. Okay. Um, but okay, I see something else happening here. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, one of the very uh, surprising results that you found is that indeed uh, the particle gets kicked out of rest and starts we, uh, oscillating back and forth a little bit. But uh, physicists would think uh, in analogy with a Compton effect, right? So you get hit by a photon. And so you transfer a certain amount of kinetic energy and momentum to your particle, and it will start moving at the expense of the uh, electromagnetic field. Of course, you don't have photons. You have a classical uh, scalar field. But it's it's really uh, uh, stunning that at the end of the day, uh, uh, so the, the particle sheds off all the extra uh, 
kinetic energy that it has picked up no, and momentum. However, uh, the, uh, the vertex, the tip of your triangle has been lowered and it enters the definition of the effective mass. So does that mean that the particle comes to rest but with a different mass at the end of the day? Yeah, no? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It comes to rest with a different mass. Okay. Um, That's very curious, very curious. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in fact, something that I want to note is that, um, yeah, so if you if you consider the, the kind of classical Compton picture uh, of this, in that case, what you should find is that like, you know, your photon comes and it hits the particle and imbues it with some, uh, with, with, with some energy, uh, some, with some kinetic energy. And then the reason why it's shedding energy is because any motion of the particle will also cause it to emit radiation. And so that's what it's doing continuously in this picture, right? You can see that the particle begins wiggling. And so that's causing the field to have these tiny wiggles. Um, when I'm talking about these wiggles, I'm not talking about these little things right here, but yeah, I'm no. rather talking about how there's these large scale wiggles happening. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm slowly running out of time. So I need to start talking about the new stuff. Um, so let's talk about the new stuff. So the new stuff is I, um, let's talk about the well posedness in the case of N scalar particles. This is kind of the, the much more exciting bit which is um, in the case of n scalar particles, then uh, rather than dealing with external radiation, we're just going to be dealing with um, the uh, potential terms generated by the particles themselves. So there's n different uh, pieces of the scalar field U now. There's the freely evolving stationary state solutions, right? So the uh, I'm, I'm taking n scalar particles that are initially at rest, um, like this, and then um, so they they're the stationary state solution of the i charge. The stationary potential of the i charge is given by by this, and I'm letting it freely freely propagate. Uh, and then we also have the contributions of the um, the scalar potential that's actively being sourced by the i charge. So. We have these IIs, which is the freely evolving um, stationary potential. Uh, and notice that this is now centered at ZI of zero. Because in before, we had just a single particle, so I centered it at the origin. Now I need to center all of these at the initial location of the i charge. Um, and also we have these, um, we have these WIs, and these WIs represent the uh, scalar fields sourced by the i part. So we also have the following uh, evolution equations. The force law is now given by same deal, right? We have the self-force term, but for our external force terms, uh, we have that each particle is enacting a force on the other particles, right? So namely the fields generated by the um, J not equal to i particle is acting on the i particle, and so I'm summing over all of these terms here. Uh, and so we'd like to see whether this also gives rise to a well-posed joint evolution, at least for all times for which this force law uh, works, is, is, is given. And recall that this force law is only given for all time until two particles collide. So to gain some intuition about what's going on here, let's fix i, so we're just going to look at a single particle, uh, one of the one of the n particles, and let's let v be equal to the uh, potentials generated by all of the other particles. So what we have is that by our previous theorem, the we have the existence of a unique particle trajectory if partial 1v is bounded and Lipschitz. So if we can prove that partial 1v is bounded in Lipschitz, we can just treat the, um, the force that's generated by the other particles on the i particle as just this like external radiation. But the issue is that we cannot really prove that partial 1v is bounded in Lipschitz because this external radiation is not something that's given to us. Uh, before, 
the external radiation was something that was given to us. But now we have that the external radiation depends on the trajectories of particles, which have yet to be solved for. In fact, we've yet to even really prove their existence um, yet. So this is the dilemma that we face. So here is the solution that we, we realized. Uh, if you consider the dynamics of your particles for very small times, then what happens? Well, they begin stationary and then they begin to attract each other, right? Which means uh, that by locality, the J particle appears stationary to the I particle for some small amount of time. Because in order for the I particle to know that any of the other particles have started to move, there's this locality going on. The changes can only propagate at the speed of light. So for, for some very small period of time, to the I particle, all the other particles still appear stationary. So actually, for some small amount of time, V does not depend on the trajectories of the other particles because all you really have is you just have the freely propagating stationary state solution. Okay, so that is, that's kind of the main intuition to start with, and that's how we're going to prove well posing this. So we're now going to start the main result um, of, of our paper, which is namely for any set of particle parameters with positive mass and white charges, the joint initial value problem for n scalar particles admits a unique solution until the time at which two particles collide. And the way that we're going to prove this is we first prove well posing this on a very small time interval, right? We use the fact that if we let delta one be the minimal initial distance between our particles, then by locality, right, we know what the external forces acting on our particle are. And so we can prove that there exists a unique solution to the joint initial value problem on the interval zero comma delta one over two. This delta one over two, this time, is precisely the amount of time it takes for any particle to realize that any of the other particles have started to move. I've set C, the speed of light, to be equal to one here. So perhaps, you know, if we didn't do that, we would get, um, we would get delta one over two times C. So this is a very small time interval for which no particle can really see, just based on the locality of their interactions, that any of the other particles uh, have started to move. And so therefore we can in fact solve for the V, which appears inside of our force law. And at that point, it just becomes a question of proving that this partial one V on this interval is bounded in Lipschitz, which is quite easy to do. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not difficult to, to do. And so once again, I'm not going to get technical with it also because I'm running out of time. So that's the general proof structure. And then once you prove it for that small time interval, all you really have to do is just extend it by that same time di distance over and over and over again. So we kind of do this by induction. If we're given a solution to the joint IVP on an interval, then we can uniquely extend the solution an additional delta t, where delta t is half the minimum distance between the end particles at time t. You can also consider this as um, uh, if the speed of light was not one, then delta t would be equal to the minimum distance between the end particles divided by two times the speed of light. So once again, it all just depends on the finite speed of propagation. The finite speed of propagation is doing a lot of work. Um, okay, so once again, I'm not going to go into the details because I'm running out of time. Um, right, we have a problem though, which is in the case of n stationary um, n scalar charges, uh, the charges are all attracting each other, which means that the assumption that we have at the start that our particles were stationary for all t less than zero, this is not physical in any sense, right? The stationary state isn't physical uh, at all. So to introduce, uh, to, to fix this, uh, we're going to introduce a repulsive interaction to generate the stationary state solutions, but we can't do that uh, in the case of scalar particles because scalar particles are purely attractive. So we're going to um, introduce electromagnetism actually to fix this. 
So the idea is we're going to introduce a repulsive interaction. We perturb those end particles, uh, uh, the stationary state, with some sort of incoming radiation. So we're going to introduce a uh, vector potential, an amu, and in the Lorentz gauge, our field equations are just given by del inversion of amu is given by the right hand side is just consists of the um, n singularities where uh, with proportion ei where these are the, the the charges the electric charges of our particles um, and once again we can compute the electromagnetic force uh, just by essentially the exact same force law that we had earlier right we want to ensure that our uh, energy is conserved, uh, but surprisingly, we find that um, there is no self-force term when it comes to uh, vector potentials. I, I'm, didn't, I'm not giving this enough time, but there's a really deep thing that's going on here, that when you compute this, the fact that you only get the charge multiplied by the electric uh, E, EXT, this is a result of the fact that the, um, the in one plus one dimensions, Electromagnetism is actually incredibly trivial. Uh, for instance, it's well known that electromagnetism in one plus one dimensions does not admit any electromagnetic waves, which means that the process of back reaction cannot happen for, elect for electric particles in one plus one dimensions, because uh, the whole point of back reaction is that the motion of your particle should cause the particle to admit uh, electromagnetic waves um, and that causes the particles kinetic energy and momentum to get sapped um, and get drained. But that doesn't happen for electromagnetism because vector potentials cannot admit um, the, their dynamics are so trivial. There are no electromagnetic waves in one plus one dimensions. So this once again, it's, it's sad in a sense that there is no self force for electromagnetism in one plus one dimensions. But this also gives us a stronger intuition that yes, it's the wave nature of back, it's the, the, um, it's the process of back reaction and the fact that our particle is emitting waves that's directly causing the self force that's acting on our particles. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, sorry for, for going over time. Um, so just a brief review. In this talk, we talked about the dynamics of point charges acting as singularities and fields in one space dimension. Um, using local conservation of energy, we derive the unique force law that describes the motion of our particle. We show that this force law is in fact admissible. It gives rise to a well-posed joint initial value problem for the system of n-scalar electric charges. And then we studied the asymptotic behavior uh, and found that a stationary particle will asymptotically return towards rest. In terms of future work, there's three different routes that we're interested in moving from here. Um, in particular, classically, we're interested in studying uh, the massive scalar field case, right? So this is in the case that our, our scalar field is massive, alpha greater than zero. Uh, in that case, the dynamics are a little bit uh, less trivial. And in fact, we think that our results in the massive scalar field case will be very illuminating um, in its applications to understanding self forces in three uh, dimensions. Um, we're also interested in studying back reaction quantum mechanically. In particular, we're introducing and uh, replacing our force law with a Bohmian law of motion. Um, and the way that we'll do that is by allowing the field to appear in the equation of psi. Um, in other words, the, the field, um, so the wave function guides the particle and then the field guides the wave function because the field appears in the wave function and the field is sourced by the particle itself. And so we're interested in studying what kind of results we get from that system. Um, yes. So, and lastly, we're also interested in uh, studying this in the context of general relativity, particularly because we know that uh, if you take a point particle and we allow it to act as a singularity in the curvature of space time, then the motion of a point particle should cause it to emit gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves carry energy. And so that should, in some sense, cause the, uh, a process of gravitational back reaction. And so something that I'm particularly really excited about studying is uh, seeing if I can prove, starting just in one plus one dimensions, um, showing that a point particle in a curved space time that is acting as a singularity for it, 
um, it will asymptotically return towards rest due to the process of back reaction. Um, so yeah, that's, that's everything. Here are my references. Um, and once again, thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak. All right, let's uh, thank Larry for...